Hello to all the pediatrics enthusiasts of the world. This is Pediatrics Chapter 27. So in Chapter 27, we're going to talk about the child and the condition of the blood, blood forming organs, and lymphatic system, okay? Now, this chapter is a little bit hefty, all right? So we're going to attack it, and I'm thinking maybe two parts, but... Y'all know how it is. Sometimes it ends up being three. But we're going to try. All right? So let's start out by talking about the lymphatic system. Now, the lymphatic system is uh, is the drains, okay? So it drains regions of the body to the lymph nodes, where infectious organisms are destroyed and antibody production is stimulated. Now, the lymph... Um, the lymph empathy is an enlargement of the lymph nodes. It is indicative of an infection or a disease, which is why it's so important when you guys are doing your head to toe and then you are checking uh, for uh, a swelling in the lymph nodes. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for a sign of infection or a sign of disease. Now, the spleen is the largest organ that is in the, lymph the lymphatic system, and it is one of the main functions that it brings blood into contact with the lymphocytes all right now the most common pathological condition is the enlargement of the spleen which we call uh spleen megaly all right now this in this enlarges during an infection uh congenital or acquired hemolytic anemias and liver malfunctions now when we're dealing with circulating of the blood um, we're going to talk about the two portions. So circulating of the blood consists of two portions. So we have the plasma. Um, let's talk about plasma. And then we have the formed elements. The formed elements has three little subtypes. It has the erythrocytes, the leukocytes, which is, you know, the WBCs, and the thrombocytes, which is the platelets. So you have plasma, okay? That's one portion of the blood. Then you have, you know, the formed elements, erythrocytes, leukocytes, uh, thrombocytes. Now, with the erythrocytes, this transports oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from the lungs and the tissue. That's what the erythrocytes do. Now, the leukocytes act as the body's defense against infection. We need them bad boys. And the lymphocytes are produ the products in the lymph nodes, uh, tissues of the body. Now, I know so many people are anemic, okay? So many people are anemic. So let's talk about anemias. Now, here's a little doo -doo side note. People need to take anemias seriously, okay? Now, women always hear that they're anemic, and so it's kind of like, doo -doo -doo, they said I'm anemic, la, la, la. Well, baby girl. You need to really take this seriously and turn that around because anemia, you might say like, oh, my mom's anemic, my aunt, my sister's a do to do You need to handle that because if not, it could cause other problems, okay? Now, anemias can result from many different underlying causes. A re an anemia is a reduction in the amount of circulating hemoglobin that reduces the oxygen-carrying ability in the blood. Girl, who wants that? You don't want your blood to have oxygen? We, we need that, okay? So, this is a the a hemoglobin that is below 8 grams per deciliter. This results in an increased cardiac output and a shunting of blood from the periphery to the vital organs. This can result in people feeling weak. They can have tachypnea, shortness of breath, um, CHF. They can even have some pallor. Did I say weakness? I think I did. But that is all involved in it as well. So these are some of the signs and symptoms of anemia that we need to take a a good look at and pay attention to. Now, then we have iron deficient anemia. Now, this is most common nutritional deficiency in children. Um, and it is in uh, incident is higher during infancy from like the ninth to the 24th month and adolescence. They may have some nutritional deficits that we need to make sure that we handle and um, clear for those babies, those young children, those adolescents. Now, this may be caused by severe hemorrhage and the inability to absorb iron received. This is a, this could uh, have some excessive growth requirements or an inadequate diet. So, during those growth spurts and things like that, which is why I said adolescents and which is why it's a certain part of their infancy, that they could battle with that because of those growth uh, requirements. Now, giving 
things like whole cow milk to infant can lead to some GI bleeding, leading to some more anemia. But y'all know my thought on that. Um, tit, do what you will. But I'm just going to say, cow milk is for cows. But I'm off the soapbox now, okay? But we know that giving a child cow milk can lead to them having anemia. Now, with the iron deficient anemia, their manifestations can be pallor, irritability, anorexia, and a decrease in activity. Infants may be overweight due to excessive milk consumption. So that's another thing that we are wanting to please pay attention to. Now, for us to check for anemia, we're going to do a series of blood tests, like the red blood cell count. We're going to do the H&H uh, &H, uh, evaluation lab, an iron concentration, all right, and a morphological cell changes test. Now, the stool may also be checked for us to do an occult blood stool testing to make sure that they're not having some kind of GI bleed. Now, um, let's talk about untreated iron deficiency anemias. This will progress slowly. And in severe cases, they can have heart muscle weakness so that that heart muscle does not function as well. All right? And children with long-standing anemias may also show growth retardation and cognitive disabilities or changes. Now, the treatment for any iron deficient anemias is that the iron usually ferrous sulfate uh, should be given like orally two to three times a day if this is needed of course the physician would let them know how much they need but here's another thing they need to receive vitamin c along with it because that is what aids in dige i mean in absorption so you can't just take iron without taking vitamin c because it needs something to help it bind okay and another thing people say well what about the child getting um uh, constipated because you know they think about constipation when an adult is on uh, iron supplement and you have to do the same thing make sure that they have the proper fiber in their bodies so that that does not happen now we're going to move on and talk about the two types of let's talk about sickle cell disease so there's two types all right so sickle cell trait Okay, let's get it together. The sickle cell trait is the asymptomatic. This is where the blood of the patient contains a mix of hemoglobin A and sickle cell, which is hemoglobin S. Now, the proportion of the hemoglobin S are low because of the disease that is inherited from only one parent. So, the hemoglobin and the red blood cell count are normally normal on a child that has sickle cell trait, which is asymptomatic. But then we have the kids who have sickle cell anemia. This is more severe. They have the full blood sickle cell disease. And this is a clinical symptoms that do not appear until the last part of the first year of the child's life. That's when it is most likely noted. Now, this may be uh, unusual. They may have like some swelling of their fingers and toes, some un... Um, Un, you know, explained pain. They can have symptoms that are caused by enlarging bone marrow sites that impair circulation to the bone and the abnormal sickle cell shape that causes clumping and uh, obstruction into the vessel and some ischemia to the organ and the vessel supplies. So I, I basically say to um, clients who have sickle cell disease, uh, when or when people ask, like, well. You know, why does it, why, what's going on? It, it, the disease tells you the blood cell looks sickled, right? So as pointy and it's very pointy and sickly, which is why it can scar, which is why it makes larger spots in the bone marrow, um, which gives that bone pain, which is why they have all of this unfused pain that is, can be going around in their organs, okay? Now, let's talk about the manifestations of sickle cell. Well, their hemoglobin level ranges from six to nine or lower. The child could be very, very pale, uh, tires out easily, has little to no appetite, 
Um, sickle cell crises, they can go into crises and the crises are very painful to them. The crises can be fatal. The symptoms can be from severe abdominal pain, muscle spasms, leg pain, painful swollen joints. They, all these things have been seen before. They can have fever, vomiting, uh, hematuria, convulsions even, stiff neck. Uh, they can go into a coma, paralysis. All of this can be a result from sickle cell disease. These children are at risk for strokes that and a um, more complicated thing. They can have some basal occlusions due to the sickle cell crisis. Please make note that Demerol is not recommended. Demerol is not recommended for a child with sickle cell anemia. Please make note of that. Now, let's talk about the types of sickle cell crises. Where the, we have the vaso-occlusive, that's the painful crises. Then we have the splenic um, secretion. Then we have a plastic crises and hyperhemophiliac crises. Those are the different types of crises uh, for sickle cell. All right, um... Story time. Um, I used to work, y'all know I'm a labor delivery nurse, and um, there was a child who he would always come to the labor delivery floor, um, and you did hear me right, it, it, he, it's a he, it's a young man, and he was coming to our floor because our floor, even though we have hectic points, um, they we did not have a pediatric unit at this particular hospital that uh, I was working at at the time. So they would always put him on med surge. Well, the med surge nurses, you know, just couldn't really handle him and his needs. And so he would come to our floor and I watched him go through so many sickle cell crises and it was the same thing every time. Um, he did, in fact, you know, lose his life to sickle cell anemia. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that nurses have to know the disease process so that they can manage those clients will. And I am so happy that those nurses that happened to be on that med surge floor understood that they could not manage him well and that the hospital that we worked in at the time gave them the ability to transfer him to another unit so that we could manage his pain, so that we can, you know, do education, so that we can make sure that we were able to go in and out of his room often to help him and to educate him and to deal with his pain and his fears adequately because a lot of times managing them um, helps them um, more than anything else because you can't cure them, you know? So let's move on and let's talk about uh, thalassemia. Now, thalassemia is a group of hereditary blood disorders in which the patient's body cannot produce sufficient adult hemoglobin. Now, the red blood cells are abnormal in size, Um, and they are abnormal in shape. Um, they are very rapidly destroyed as well. And this can result in chronic anemia. Now, the body attempts to compensate by producing large amounts of fetal hemoglobin. Okay? Now... Uh, the ethnic group that is mainly affected by thalassemia is Mediterranean, okay? That's the ethnic group that is most affected by um, thalassemia. Now, thalassemia is categorized according to the polypeptide chain that is affected. So we have the beta thalassemia. This is the most common variety. And this involves impaired production of beta chains. There's two forms. There's a thalassemia minor and a thalassemia major. This is also known, the thalassemia major is also known as Cooley anemia. Cooley anemia. C-O-O-L-E-Y. Now, this can also occur from spontaneous mutations. Now, 
Now, this one right here, hemophilia. Now, hemophilia is an inherited sex-linked recessive trait. The defective gene is located on the X chromosome. The fetal blood samples detect hemophilia. Then we have um, the two most common types, hemophilia B, which is called Christmas disease. Did y'all hear me? Hemophilia B is called Christmas disease. And this is a factor um, nine deficiency, okay? Hemophilia A is a deficiency and factor eight. Now, a deficiency in any one of these factors will interfere with normal blood clotting. Now, let's talk a little bit about hemophilia A. Hemophilia A is caused by a deficiency of coagulation from factor 8 or anti-hemophilia globulin. Now, the severity depends on the level of factor 8 in the plasma. Some patients' li uh, lives can be endangered by a minor scratch, but others may simply bruise more easily than the average person. So everybody is different. We aim of therapy is to increase the levels of factor eight to ensure that these clients can clot. This is checked by a blood test called the PTT, which is the partial thromboplastin time, the PTT. Okay, so let's talk about some of the manifestations of hemophilia. This can be diagnosed at birth because of the factor eight. This cannot cross the placenta and be transferred to the fetus. Usually, this is not apparent in the newborn unless there's some abnormal bleeding that occurs at the umbilical cord or at the uh, after the circ uh, circumcision. Now, the normal blood clot in th is uh, three to six minutes, but in some severe hemophilia, it can take up to one hour or longer. Now, the manifestations of hemophilia is where the um, anemia, the leukocytosis, these are moderately increased in the platelets and may be seen in hemorrhaging and may also be a sign of shock. Now, some spontaneous hematuria, hem you know, bleeding in the urine, um, is also seen. Now, death can result from excessive bleeding, especially if it occurs in the brain or in the neck. Severe headache, vomiting, and some deterioration may also be a symptom. Oh, okay. Now we have some idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, which is also ITP. Now, this is an acquired platelet disorder that occurs in childhood. Now, it is most common of the purpurus. This is called, this cause is unknown. We don't know why it's happening, but it is thought to be an autoimmune reaction to a virus. Platelets may become coated with antiplatelet antibodies, and then it is seen as foreign, and they are eventually destroyed by the spleen. And ITP occurs in all age groups, with main incidents being seen from people children between the ages of two and four years old. 
Now, the manifestations of ITP are things like classic symptoms, like they have easy bruising, they may have some uh, purpura, they may have some petechiae, um, they may have recent medical histories of things like rubella or um, rubola. They may also have other viral respiratory infections. The intervals are between exposures and onset is about two weeks. So when we have children that have these respiratory infections, we should not take them lightly because other things can happen. Now, their platelet count will be below 20,000. Normal range is between 150 to 400,000. The diagnosis is confirmed by a bone marrow aspiration. Now, the treatment for ITP, now there's a neurologic assessments that are priority of care. The treatment is not indicated in most cases. If indicated, they may get some prednisone, they may get some IV gamma globin and anti-D antibodies. These may also be, um, are some of the treatments Options in case of chronic ITP, a splenotomy may be required. Other treatments are for them to avoid certain drugs, so like they have to avoid drugs like aspirin, caffeine, uh, phenocentin, phenobartazone. These things should be avoided. The activity is limited during acute states to avoid bruising. So we don't want them to do any um, activities that may, you know, be contact or that they may fall and get hurt. Um, and the platements are usually not given because they will be destroyed anyway due to the disease process. Now, there are several complications for ITP, like bleeding from the GI tract, intracranial hemorrhaging, uh, hematherosis, and the prevention uh, of this may be helped by immunizing all children against viral diseases of the childhood. So there is some um, things that we could do prior to that would help children not have to deal with this. On to part two.